I'm Roland Kuhn. I'm the uh, tech lead of the ACA project, working for TypeSafe. And today I will uh, tell you about um, how I use macros uh, to implement type channels on top of ACA actors. Uh, that is a project which I hoped doing since quite a while. Um, it was sparked um, during last Scala days by a talk by Simon Peyton Jones, talking about Haskell in the cloud and so on, and all the nice things you can do there. And I thought that must be possible, but um, thinking about it, and I talked to, to Miles uh, about doing it in the type system and so on, but that seemed too daunting a task. Uh, so I waited until macros became available, because that makes the implementation basically trivial. Uh, it, it's still a bit tricky, but uh, it would be a lot more tricky without macros, I'm sure. So what is the problem I'm trying to solve? The problem is uh, a line like this. So we have some actor, and we send it a message. That's command one in this case. This is supposed to be a command which is understood by that actor. That is clear. Um, but uh, either it was someone was lazy or something got refactored because, in truth, this does not send a command. It sends the companion object to the case class, which would have been the command. Um, and the compiler cannot warn about this. The compiler cannot help you with this and flag it as an error, as of now, uh, with untyped actors, because um, the bang operator or the tell method takes any as a message. So what we'd like to have is some kind of operation. I'm using uh, this fancy left pointing arrow just because I didn't know anything better up to now. So this sends the message which is on the right to the actor which is on the left. And uh, the compiler will actually yell at you if you try to use the companion object and it will not work. That is the idea, that the compiler forces you to do the, the right thing here. What that means is that the actor ref, which was on the left, uh, somehow needs to know which the type is which is allowed for the message. Only then can, it, can the compiler check uh, that the message is actually a subtype of that and that it works. Um, actor refs are produced by an actor system or within an actor system uh, using factory methods. And uh, they use actor uh, classes, so classes implementing the actor trait. Um, as a template, so in the end, it must come from there. Nobody else knows. So the actor must declare uh, what its allowed input types are. Then, when we have that, we can verify uh, the message type against this at the call site. In ACA, we have something else. Uh, every message sent is accompanied by the sender reference. So there can be replies. And these replies, uh, it would be really nice if they could also be typed. So I imagine uh, we have the ask operation. I have the question mark in, in this arrow here for, to signify this. Normally, you would get back a future any, because the compiler does not know better with what the actor might actually reply. But in this case, we have um, the knowledge as a programmer. We, we write this actor. When it gets a command, it gives you back a response. So it should be a future of response and not of any. What that need, uh, needs uh, is that the actor ref not only needs to know about the uh, input message type, it also needs to know what possible reply type might be. And that again means that the actor trait needs to be parameterized with these types. And then at the call side of the ask operation, uh, we can extract the reply type out of this ref um, to, for example, get, get you the, the right future or to check when an, an actor does the send and then the reply comes, that this actor will actually be able to understand the response. There's one problem. Uh, if we just allow one type, though. So if we say we have a new actor ref uh, which takes a T and gives you back a U, for example. Um, if you have actors uh, which wrap other actors. One example would be the re reliable proxy pattern, uh, which is in, in ACA itself, or you have a message th throttler. So you have some actor which you give a target actor ref, and this actor takes the message stream which would go there and trans transforms it in some way, either by delaying, by dropping messages, or by transforming the messages. Um, this outer actor needs to process two types of messages. The real business ones, and some management channel coming from the side, telling, for example, the throttler what the message rate uh, allowed shall be. 
And these types are in general not related at all. They are written by different people, possibly in completely different places. And the common supertype will be any ref for all practical purposes. So this means that uh, in order to avoid this loss of type safety incurred by wanting to do two channels, uh, we need to have really lists of types. And with the reply types, so an actor might reply either with a positive or negative response, for example, and we want to uh, mod uh, model that. So reply types could also be lists of types. And that means um, that what we need to compute is not simply subtype of something and then the corresponding one will be the reply type. No, we will have to implement something like a type map. And that is, I asked uh, uh, Martin Odersky about it, um, whether it would be a good idea to try that in the type system. And he said, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so he was not entirely confident, and this is why I said, okay, then, then I'll, I'll have to wait for macros uh, to do this. When we have this, um, I thought we can do something a bit better uh, even than we have today. And I thought it would be more natural if, if we want to model message flows, uh, that the message actually flows from, from left to right. So the first step was to turn around these operators. I have the message on the left-hand side, and then I have the ask operator uh, to ask, to send the message to the first actor, which will give me back a future with the reply. And then that future can be used as an input for the second ask to the second actor, which gives me back a new future. And that future can be used to send back to the original client at some future, future point of time, in time. Um, another thing, uh, in there, I mean, the second line demonstrates a possibly very common use case that you have uh, an actor which is actually the target of a spray route or a play route or anything like that. It asks some backend service and then it um, needs to transform the reply coming back, making it an HTTP OK response and then get it back to the whoever called the service. And in this sense, I would say, since this, all of this is now statically type checked, just like you have your map, flat map, and, and so on, operations or collections, and everything is type checked. These are also completely type checked, like composing functions. The first one, you compose the functions of the two actors. You wire them together, in the, if you look in, in the sense of the, the pi calculus, um, if, if I'm not mistaken there. Um, and this can be done from the outside to make actors actually compose. And the result of all of this uh, would be that you can compose your actor systems in a type safe fashion. That you do not need to rely on, for example, um, tests to verify that you didn't make some stupid mistakes uh, in your match statements. Uh, I recently uh, started looking into actually reading up in PyCalculus because I'm just a physicist, sorry, I didn't know about this before. I just wrote that, and then um, I, th I think uh, Miles said, uh, yeah, are you doing distributed pi calculus? I started reading up on that, and I have not yet finished reading even the first book, but I came to the conclusion that actors might actually be comp uh, composite processes in this, in this uh, calculus. And um, the important part is that their types are structural and, and not nominal. Um, I think you'll see what that means in, on the next, uh, uh, next slide. And as I showed you, we can do process wiring in a situational way, at least. Um, but all of this is a pretty embryonic state of my understanding of pi calculus and actors. So uh, if, if you have inputs or would like to discuss it, I, um, I would love to do a session on that tomorrow uh, if someone is interested and in, in knowledgeable and, and we, can, we can get a discussion going. Um, I wrote up uh, all the design rationals I had for this um, on, in the Akadox. This has been merged into Akka Masters, so you can try it out if you build from source, or you can wait for the first milestone of 2.2, which comes out in a week or so. Now, let's, I mean, that was the nice and easy part. Now let's descend into the underworld. So uh, let me start by, by showing you the types I'm using. Uh, first of all, we need uh, type lists, as I said. So that's the con cell of a type list right there with the colon plus colon, which takes, uh, first of all, the, the head of the list, 
uh, which is a pair of in and out message type, and then the tail, obviously. And there is a T nil accompanying it, uh, as usual. That is the basic type which, which I'm operating on. Uh, a channel ref is a value class wrapping an actor ref, uh, whose only purpose is to carry such a channel list, so we can do computations on it. And uh, then there is an actor mix in called channels, so you can say actor with channels, and that actually has two such type parameters, one for its parent, you can, you can send to context.parent, uh, and one for its self channel, which it can hand out to others. As there can be many possible reply types, not just one uh, for a single message send, um, the future which comes back would either have to have the least upper bound only or uh, it needs a more specific type and that's what the wrapped message does. Uh, this is only necessary because Scala does not support um, type unions natively, I think. If you have ideas, we can talk later. Um, so the idea behind all of this is that all these checks are done at compile time and they just vanish. The bytecode produced shall be as close as possible to not having used any of this, to not lose the performance. So in, uh, in the end it will go, simply it will be tell and ask after the type check, with the possible exception of actually needing to wrap wrapped messages. So how does uh, such an actor look like? This is an actor with channels, which is a slightly strange echo. And the first parameter, um, which is tnil here, the type parameter, that is the description of the parent channel. This actor does not talk to its parent, so empty list. The real one is the second one, and it says it accepts messages of type string, and it may reply with strings. This does not imply that it must reply with, uh, with a string. Yeah? It just confines the reply type to be at most string. There are uh, basically two ways of writing it down. Um, when you say channel for string, then you need to give it a function two. And the reason for that is, um, first you need to get the message in, str in this case, uh, which will be typed statically as string here, and the sender. And that is necessary. You cannot just use context.sender or anything because that is untyped. I, I wouldn't know how to attach the changing reply types uh, if there are many of those uh, otherwise. So I send in the sender reference. And this sender reference will only accept strings. And that's why this, this echo works. You can also, I mean, it's a function too, so you, so you can implement it using partial function syntax if you wish. Now, these uh, lambdas pose the first problem. Lambdas are, they are parsed, and then when typer sees them in the Scala compiler, the typer phase, um, it will desugar them into anonymous uh, inner classes implementing function two in this case. The problem is that that happens before macro in, uh, uh, invocation if this would be an argument to the macro. And then the macro would be able to compute all the types but you couldn't apply the types to the closure anymore because the closure has already been desugared. That means, um, well, the lambda is not an argument to the channel method. It actually um, is an argument to the apply method of whatever is returned from channel. Um, that was the workaround I found. Um, yeah, so this shows you, uh, I call it behaviorist for want of a better name. Uh, that's basically the, uh, thing which is emitted and which has the right apply type. And uh, what you have here is um, some arbitrary thing. So the macro will calculate this R and it's completely free in what it, what it calculates there. It could also be a function one or anything else. And the compiler would then type check whatever comes after channel in the right way. This is pretty convenient. I have this code in here for another reason. Uh, so I want to get the runtime class because Dispatching the messages at runtime will need to operate on runtime classes. And uh, to get the runtime class of some type, it is advisable to call not, uh, to not use T here simply, which is a type, but to call widen on it. Uh, because otherwise, if you use singleton types, like you have a case object A, and you say A dot type, and you put it in there, it will give some weird exception. 
Now, let's look at the macro itself. Uh, I mean, this is just the uh, shell of the macro. So what we see here, um, we have, uh, the, this is the implementation of the macro, and then it has a lot of type arguments, uh, type parameters. Uh, that is maybe not always the case, but it is the case bec in, in here because I'm doing type calculations. That, that's what I'm doing. You see two different types of arguments. These are normal ones. Now they don't have any type tags, the first three. And then you have the one with type tags. Uh, the one with type tags, they are input parameters. So I get the type tags uh, from the compilation uh, of the, the call side of the macro, so I, I can calculate with them. And the other ones are, as we see, as we will see, output arguments, so to speak. Need to be declared there as well. Then, uh, one thing, the context on which this macro is invoked um, is passed in here, and you can restrict the prefix type to be just something very specific. That means uh, that this macro can only be used on something which is a channels. And it has the benefit, when I splice here, c.prefix.splice, it will actually have the right type. So this, this does type check. If you don't do this, then there is no type here, and you will get, you will have to cast. Uh, another thing is, um, if you ever have tried this, you can, before the dot splice, you can put any expression which returns a tree. And uh, you could be tempted to put an expression there which, which contains a reify. At least I was tempted at some point. Uh, don't do it. Um, I'm using Eclipse, and there uh, you get these yellow pop-ups when you do something wrong. Um, and uh, they have a little font displaying the error message. And this pop-up filled the whole screen. <laughs> and, and it had three dots at the end. So um, this is something which is apparently not supported. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I have this prep tree here outside, and then I can splice it in here. That, that, that works. Um, another interesting thing is that type tags work if you use the right universe. Yeah, you have a universe, um, uh, th that's not shown here, that's um, C dot universe, which is, no, uh, actually not. So, it, there is, in, in C there is a universe, and if you, if you try to use that, it will fail, because there is no implicit type tag for that path to get to type tag. Universe here is actually the runtime universe, which you need to use, and then Reify is smart enough to transform this, to, tr to transport this type information, uh, across the reification step. That is pretty neat. I'll go more in detail about that later. And then, uh, how is this wired up? Uh, we have this trait channels, uh, which has the parent and our self channel uh, type arguments. I'm preferring a self type annotation for this one uh, that has, not, has nothing to do with the reasoning Daniel um, presented this morning. It's just to force people to write actor with channels because that looks so nice. Um, if I would just extend actor, then you could write, my actor extends channels. Uh, that's, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit of a bitch here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, channel is just a normal method which returns some function type. Yeah? It returns something which has an apply method. And the most uh, general thing I can return due to contravariance is the function nothing to unit. It's not any two unit, that was, would be the most specific one. Um, and then we call this macro. These first three just need to satisfy whatever type bounds were declared here. Now this is a channel list. This is not restricted. Apart from that, it's, that's not checked. And um, there was one thing here. I wanted to create this new behaviorist, but calling new on this um, inner class does not work because I would call, need to call new on c.prefix.splice. That's not valid, valid Scala syntax, unfortunately. This is why I had to introduce this method uh, here which just wraps this. That's to get around some, some syntax limitations. And then the macro will return something which conforms to this. This is important here. 
Yeah, th that needs to match this one. This one needs to be a subtype of whatever is declared at the macro use side. And then whatever is reified needs to be a subtype of what I intend to return. There are many type checks at play when writing macros. Um, next topic, let me show you one simple type calculation. Uh, just to show you what I mean when I said I, I waited for macros because I think that would have been much harder um, to write j purely in the type system. So, first of all, we always need to pass around this universe. Types and everything and symbols and so on, they live in a universe uh, in the compiler. So this channels is universe.type and required is a list of such types. And then I just iterate, so uh, tail recursively across this, um, this type list. So yeah, I have this const cells, um, colon plus colon, they have two type arguments. So I'm always interested in the first type argument and there that was a pair of in and out. I'm only interested in the in, this matches here. I think this match statement will look a lot nicer once we have quasi-quotations uh, for those. Uh, this manual deconstruction of type ref, that is quite kind of the, the ugly part. But apart from that, it's just normal collections operations, right? I, um, I filter not and uh, I uh, um, yeah, take out, uh, so every type I encounter here by traversing this type level list uh, is removed from these list of required types in the usual fashion. So that's what I wanted to show here. There's one quirk, um, I found a ticket for that. If you could say, why, isn't, why is this inner method necessary? It is, if you could just do, make this one tail recursive, um, that actually crashes the compiler. It doesn't work. So uh, mixing tail recursion specifically with uh, these um, path dependent types doesn't seem to work. This is why I import the universe members here and then access them in here. That is not a problem anymore. This can be, this, this is a normal tail recursive thing. Now, type calculation, um, the point was to return the type. So to actually get the type back into the calling context. And at first I thought, okay, this is weird. Reify is about trees, but not so much about type trees. <clears throat> How do I return this thing? And I, at the first try was to actually uh, write down C dot apply type and all these ugly thingies. There was screenfuls of, of implementation for that uh, until I discovered that, so I, I declare here reply channels. I have an implicit val <coughs> which is of type type tag of reply channels. And that will be picked up by reify when I use this reply channels anywhere. So I, I left these dots in here to show you this is nested in some other types. Yeah, it's, it's down I inside them, th some composite type. And it still figures it out and takes this type tag when it encounters that and puts that into the reify tree. And then you can put here any type you want. You have calculated channels is a u dot type, and it's just in there, and that transports it across the barrier into the macro expan expansion, and that simplified the code by an order of magnitude at least. There's one uh, little problem uh, I encountered next, uh, that is I have an operation uh, narrowing um, channel refs, so uh, I can remove channels, for example. Uh, input channels without violating any constraints, and that is done by a macro. But at runtime, I can also, uh, that you can look up actors using actor4, and then you don't get any type information. So I have implemented an operation where you can send a message, hey, do you implement these types? Is that, is that you? And uh, that does the same thing, the same check, only at runtime. Uh, writing the same code twice is ugly, of course, and uh, I just reused it. This, uh, I, I named it X, so it's short. Uh, this would be the, the missing channels or something. Uh, what I discovered is, I have a top t at runtime, I have a type tag from the runtime universe. And I p pass it in here. The macro universe is not a subtype or anything of, of the runtime universe. Um, it is a more general universe. But that should work. I mean, I have a universe, right? 
just by um, losing this information that we are dealing with statically known, the runtime universe, the compiler got very confused and I got runtime exceptions. Uh, what you need to do in this case, you need to make a, an importer uh, from this universe to that universe. And then when you want to use types, like here, re reply channels, you need to import them. Even though this import is just from the same universe to the same. I, I'm not sure what the bug there is, but uh, yeah, something which needed figuring out. You don't need to do this dance uh, for types with come, which come with the Scala library, though. Like nothing. That just works. Uh, the last topic, uh, but not the least important, is how to test this. And I thought, yeah, this is going to be complicated. There are sometimes questions on the mailing list, how to uh, um, fake such a context and so on to, to do it. Um, but if you just decide, I want to run some, the compiler on some code and, and see what it does, that is extremely simple. You just um, need Scala compiler on the class path. And then you can ask the runtime mirror to make you a toolbox giving some compile time options. And uh, then on this toolbox, you can invoke parse for some string of code. And then you can invoke eval on the resulting tree to evaluate it. It's quite simple. You just need to give it the right class path so it will find everything it needs. And then the test looks like this. Yeah, I just uh, write down my code as I would with the import statements. And then I have here a channel ref which accepts A, returns C. And I try to send it a B, and that's supposed to fail with a specific error message. I think that's quite straightforward. So. Uh, that is basically all I thought should go in half an hour. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>